Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today's guests are Tanya Peterson, Executive Director and President of San Francisco Zoo, and Rich Block, uh, President and CEO of the Santa Barbara Zoo. And thank you for joining us, panel. And a reminder to our webcast guests that you can ask questions through the Q&A functions at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show. Well, it's so great to have you both on. Um, and you, you have a, a real challenge during this time when everything has been shut down because your zoos are home to living and breathing beings. They require daily and even hourly care. You can't stop operating. You can't shut the lights and go home and, and wait for three months. Uh, could you both talk about the, the challenges that you're facing and, and how you're doing during the pandemic? And let's, let's start with you, Tanya. Well, thank you again for hosting this and having us join. Um, it is something, a message we do want to get out there about the fate of zoos everywhere. Um, I think it's the, Sir David Attenborough said, if the zoos go extinct, extinct, so do the animals they're in. And that's really true. I mean, most of us now are holding species that are endangered on the version of extinction or rescue. And uh, we still had to feed them, support them, take care of them. Uh, and paid uh, quite a bit of uh, expenses, 30000 a day for us, uh, with no revenue coming in. And, and when you talk about the, uh, the trust that zoos are, if, if you look at the zoo ecosystem, you have both what we see, which is a physical location that we experience. We walk through gates, we walk from one place to another and experience these animals from a distance. But there's also the whole ecosystem that ties into conservation science and the science of preserving the species and the whole issue of, of what's happening with global warming and how that's impacting development, how that's impacting these various species. So uh, Rich, can you talk about how you're faring as, as an entity that needs to create earned income to continue operating, but also what is still going on behind the scenes in terms of the science? So in, in, in kind of a, a rough picture, 97% of our operating uh, budget is generated through earned revenue. Uh, so having people at the institution is important. Uh, I'm really glad you touched on that other dimension of, of our institutions. Uh, and that is that conservation is a part of our operating budget, which means to support the programs that we're involved with, we, we need that source of, uh, of revenue. Uh, we actually have four full-time positions that are field conservation positions. And so these are people that are trying to figure out how to work within the field constraints uh, of our partners like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to continue the work that we're doing. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we need to find the avenues to make sure that we don't have to cut back on this important work. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, all of those species that are in the wild, that are threatened, are facing uh, challenges, uh, their situation is not going to improve uh, <laughs> while we're going through uh, these, these situations. So, uh, that, you know, that's a, that's a point well taken. How do we balance that? How do we make sure that we can allocate resources in, in a way that we can support those programs while we're caring for the welfare of the animals under our care? Zoos have also transformed over the last years. When zoos originally came up, it was because we were looking as, pe as people uh, very often in, in places removed from what the animal's natural habitat. We were looking at these oddly colored, oddly shaped wild animals, and we were fascinated by them. Um, giraffes and, and zebras and, and, uh, and other small uh, stick insects and so on. But as we have gained so much access to, um, to the world of information through devices like this, right? We don't need to go to zoos for that purpose. The, the other purpose, which is the scientific purpose, the whole idea of informing people about different aspects of living on this planet are, 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 is so important. Tanya, how do you unpack the information that the scientists develop, that conservationists develop, so that it's accessible to, to the visiting public, both through the online visit, as well as the in-person visit. Uh, well, our uh, mission statement is, I, I like to just shorten it to the three C's. You know, if we connect people to our life, they'll ultimately care about it and conserve it. So I, for the very young and the new, 
to animal wildlife, just experiencing these beautiful ambassadors as they walk through the zoo. I mean, that's the first step. Uh, but we certainly provide educational signage, uh, outdoor speakers. We have naturalists and ambassadors there um, to educate. We have a whole science and wellness center. People are welcome to visit and, and gain more information. So from a very visceral, just awesome experience to a very scientific and educated experience. We try to offer it all. How will you be doing this during social distancing where people can't necessarily gather within a, a confined space? Are you mostly moving those activities just out of doors? Yeah, everything we're doing now is outdoors, even our child care programs. Uh, we're using those speakers and online uh, safaris, if you will, more to educate and constantly update, especially our membership with emails that this is the latest. But, you know, staff did, so I think Rich's staff did the same thing, local safaris so that we could help our community identify local bugs, snakes, which right in your own backyard and keep folks update what's going on here at San Francisco Zoo and Gardens. And Rich, uh, are you also moving everything outside? You've been, you've been open for now uh, three or four weeks, right? And, and Tanya is just reopening now. Have you, uh, in your experience, been able to move everything into areas where people are socially distanced safe? Right, and, and so I think all, all accredited institutions that have uh, reopened at this point, uh, any of those areas that are in, indoors and closed uh, have been, been uh, Kind of set off limits. Uh, so even some of the viewing areas that are somewhat enclosed uh, have been kind of cordoned off uh, to prevent people from congregating and, and grouping there. Uh, I mean, you know, it, this is the management challenge for, for the, the zoos right now that are open, and that is trying to not only manage social distancing, uh, but now, well, it's, it's happening everywhere, is, is to enforce the requirement for masks, uh, which is a, a huge issue. So, you know, part of our job has now become uh, sanitizing things uh, and then monitoring our guests to make sure that uh, they're safe. And this is important for our employees as well. I mean, they wanna know that when we have all these people coming in through the zoo, that, that their welfare is also being considered and that we're trying to make sure that, the, that our guests, our employees, and the animals under our care, that everyone is safe under these circumstances. You know, we've, we also have become very aware of trans species infections, right? We have coronavirus uh, that originated in bats, and we've heard about, uh, about the tiger who, who had been diagnosed with coronavirus. Are you at all concerned about those kinds of transmissions within your um, with, within your uh, animals, uh, who you care for? Well, of course we are. And with primates, we have long been concerned about uh, zoonotic transmission, maybe TB or other diseases. So our primate staff have long worn face coverings, take, sanitize the foot baths and so forth, wear gloves. Uh, once that we heard about the, uh, the pandemic, we started then asking all animal staff to wear, uh, because we just didn't, weren't sure where the transmission would occur. And then with the primates and some of those sensitive species, we now have the visitors, uh, I think at least eight to 10 feet away. So just again, not, not, not totally sure of the science, but aware that it can transmit between humans and animals. And Rich, are you doing the same thing? Oh yeah, absolutely. But the, 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 um, the, the thing that impresses me is, is that zoos have been ahead of the curve on this. I mean, our, our veterinary staff works with zoonotic disease management uh, full-time long before this was ever, I mean, pandemic wasn't even discussed at a point where all of these things were being considered. So before we even reopened, we'd already had extensive experience in, in managing uh, sanitizing areas, in, in, in the use of PPE, personal protective equipment. Uh, all of those things were already pretty standard procedure within our institutions. So aside from managing the visitors, uh, we already were practicing everything that has been laid out under the governor's plan. Um, it, it always strikes me how much this ecosystem is one that supports each other. Um, as, as you even make the decision of 
bringing another ma major species into your environs or an, or an animal, you're actually conferring with your, your fellow um, zoos in terms of, of whether the research that the research content of, of maintaining that animal is appropriate to the preservation of species. Could you talk a little bit about how you interact with other institutions within your ecosystems um, and how you, um, you consult as you make certain decisions? Rich, you wanna give a cut on that in terms of how you benefit and, and interact with other um, uh, members of the uh, zoological community? Yeah, that, 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 that's a question that we could probably talk about for a couple of hours, but, but the short answer would be, uh, institutions accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums uh, already uh, agree to uh, partner, collaborate on the management of, of common species as well as specific endangered species. So they're, it, it, it's most fundamental level, uh, zoos, accredited zoos and aquariums are already collaborating uh, to manage these species. So rather than individual institutions managing the animals in their collection, uh, teams of volunteers and professionals and small population management are working collaboratively to manage all of those as a single large population. And then of course you have Aztec as, as a great resource, right, Tanya? Absolutely, and uh, I just have to say, my background was antitrust uh, legal work uh, for companies such as Hewlett Packard, and we never exchanged information with one another. The moment I became a zoo director, I think Rich was the first to send his strategic plan and his five-year thinking and staff organization, and I, I thought, oh my goodness, we're going to get an antitrust violation for conspiracy and price fixing. <laughs> I mean, you just opened up his books and I appreciate it. And that's been true. I mean, the zoo directors generally meet once or twice a year. Uh, we certainly were in contact with each other right away. Uh, I believe our friends in the Washington and Oregon zoos were dealing with a pandemic before we were. And uh, we were watching their cases and again, started to implement what we could right away. So it's been just a, a wonderful community and an honor really to be a part of it. You're also pointing out that not everybody comes from a particularly um, predictable career path who ends up running these institutions. Um, and, and that's really important to note because the, the field is changing and different skill sets are required to run these very sophisticated uh, operations. Rich, talk a little bit about your background. Well, I mean, I mean, my background, I never thought that I'd be working in a zoo. Um, I, I came out of a kind of working with uh, environmental engineering and in field assessments uh, and then teaching at the University of Michigan. Uh, but I got infected by the zoo bug by a, a colleague, Thane Maynard, who's the, the CEO of the Cincinnati Zoo. Uh, we were grad students together. And so he kind of planted the seed. But, but I have to say, it goes back to what Tanya said, uh, one of the attractions uh, to this community for me was just this collective effort to improve the community, that everyone was so interested in sharing best practices, uh, helping those institutions that, that needed to shore up some aspect of their operation. Uh, so I love not only the collaborative spirit, but I love the sense that it's, it's not a proprietary uh, community. People really actively support each other and share. Do you each talk about um, the 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 um, the animal that that right now is engaging the most attention, small or large, in terms of of your institution and how you are trying to connect the public to your institutions. Tanya, you want to you you want to take a cut? Well, I don't know if you saw on social media, but we allowed our penguins to walk through the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> These are South American Magellanic penguins. We have the largest outdoor colony uh, in North America, actually. But we thought, well, why not? No one's at the zoo, let them roam. Um, and they became the stars. It was also interesting to see what was of interest to them. Uh, they particularly liked, I believe, the meerkats, the prairie dogs but found the red pandas and sloths boring, I suppose, <laughs> and moved on. Um, but it was just a fun way, we hope, to capture the attention that, hey, we're still here, the zoo's still here, um, and uh, make awareness of the, the plight of the penguin and other birds, especially as this uh, pandemic grows. I'm sure you're aware that ecotourism is, is down and poachers are getting the best of us in many nations. 
Yeah, I, I mean, it's really important that that we connect as beings to other beings, right? And and as we do that, it's it's almost as if we are uh, developing. We need to develop our empathy gene, our our, our awareness of how much we rely on the unconscious existence of penguins in areas that we will never visit. Right. And we can only do that by, by looking at these penguins and saying, you know, they're pretty, they're pretty interesting. Let's, let's not kill them. <laughs> um, well, I, you, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, Tanya. Well, I was just gonna say, I think we need them. We started an equine therapy program for the disabled this year. Um, and a lot of our teens and others really rely on those connections with our horses. Uh, and other animals. And, you know, so it, it just saddens me uh, that when we were closed, those connections couldn't happen. Rich, do you have a particular um, focus that you've had over the last period of time? Well, I, you know, for, for us, and certainly as, as a lot of people would say, there is a group of charismatic megavertebrates uh, that seem to not only uh, capture people's uh, attention and passion, uh, but a lot of them think of them as the iconic uh, parts of our zoos. Uh, we have two new lions uh, to, to start a new pride. And of course, they've garnered a lot of attention. Uh, a baby giraffe on the ground, one on the way, uh, literally any day now. Uh, the, the challenge is uh, giraffe feeding was one of the favorite uh, attractions at the zoo. That's something that we've had to suspend. Uh, until such time that, that we can bring that back online, that builds a, a fantastic connection. It, it goes back to, to Ed Wilson has this uh, theory about biophilia and the fact that, that we are hardwired to want to connect with nature, that it, it's just something that's part of who we are. And I, I think that's the wonderful part of zoos today is, and, and zoos and aquariums is that, that we help kind of build that connection. And, and to me, there's something very satisfying as knowing that we're kind of completing that aspect of ourselves. Um, we've we've uh, received three related questions, and it really has to do with, uh, with your point, Rich, about uh, being so reliant on earned income and, and uh, ticket sales in order to maintain the operating budget. Um, and, and some of these uh, questions are about the contributed revenue side as well. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how you see your financial status um, evolving over the next period of time and how, how you are planning? And, and it has been in the press, Tanya, that, that San Francisco Zoo uh, is really still in the midst of crisis. Um, but before we go to Tanya, Rich, could you talk a little bit about how you're navigating with, with a 97% reliance on the gate? Um, as you said, yeah. how is this, how is this uh, evolving for you? How, how do you see the next year developing? So with, with uh, so a, a team of phenomenal managers, uh, we've been able to uh, set aside some uh, financial reserves uh, that have, have, have certainly we've been depleting those like crazy. But uh, that, that has helped along with the PPP, uh, the Payroll Protection uh, Program under the CARES Act, uh, that and another small business loan. So we, we've been able to to navigate pretty well. I mean, my, I think all of us uh, experienced layoffs at some point. And uh, my, my dogs are weighing in on that. They don't like layoffs. Uh, that, I'm going to throw this to Tanya before they go crazy. <laughs> Tanya. Let the dogs have it. No, uh, but you, yeah. you've, you've had to deal with some very serious situations. Could you just sort of uh, run us through where you've been and, and, and how this is developing? Well, initially with the shutdown, we went to skeletal staffs trying to manage the expenses as best as we could. But as we've all discussed, we had to have care keepers. We had to have the veterinarians. We just couldn't furlough everybody. Uh, and we really reached out to our membership and our major donors to help us through this crisis. Uh, but what happened as we weren't opening and other things were opening, such as malls and uh, retails, I think our major donors and community began to worry, is there something wrong with the zoo? So then we had to get out a message that, no, actually, I think outdoor space, the science is showing that's the safest place uh, and, and that we really should be serving our local community. Uh, we're not a big tourist destination, but we really serve our family members around the zoo. So it was an education of the politicians 
constantly. <laughs> uh, we had to get a variance with our board of supervisors. So there was the lobbying effort. Uh, you know, it really did s start to turn into a multifaceted crisis, the legal, the financial, and, and the press. Um, and we wanted to do this safely. We've now opened, we were approved to open at 50% capacity. I've kept it to essentially a third. Uh, it allows a better visitor experience. I can do it safely. I can monitor it. But now, listen, I'm, I'm open with only a third of the operating revenue. I just uh, have to keep advocating to our uh, community that if you can afford to support us, uh, please do so. You know, some of our members have asked for refunds. Others have just turned it into a tax deduction. So I just appreciate those in the community who are still able to withstand and donate to uh, the zoo and other causes. How do you how do you see the zoo um, evolving, the zoo experience evolving? Because we're going to be living with this pandemic for another, oh, I, I, I'd say perhaps a year. Um, and then beyond that, this isn't going to be an isolated event. There are going to be, we're, we're in an interconnected world, there are going to be such issues. We saw the, the 2008 uh, issue. Um, how do we shape zoos so that they are uh, more resilient because right now as as your experience has shown tanya uh, they're not sufficiently resilient well we you, uh we you, we do think we're resilient in some ends i mean not one of our employees has experienced uh, or shown any signs of covid as well as our animals uh, we are on a coastline, one of the few zoos, uh, as is rich, and so I think maybe enhancing the experience at the coastline uh, and the conservation issues around the, the Pacific Ocean and there and the, is probably the next step for us. It's a, a safe next step, uh, but we, you know, we have to start using the online and the Zooms as quickly as everybody else did, and, you know, we're not... Uh, we're naturalists, we're not uh, software engineers, but we quickly had to get those online safaris and start educating uh, and providing, you know, day-to-day -day contact to our, uh, to our folks. So it, <clears throat> we have to change the paradigm of 90% of it coming through the gate. It has to be coming through, money has to be coming through other areas. And Rich, before this, we also talked about the whole idea of not only do you have to get people coming in to other areas, you have to monetize that, right? And, and, and nobody's cracked that code. Have you, have, have you been making any uh, inroads into that side of it? Well, I mean, some of the areas that, 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 that we need to look at are uh, within the membership programs. Lots of people just look at that as an annual pass to get into our institutions. Uh, what we need to do is continue to improve our brand and have it more closely wed to things like conservation and education uh, so that people feel a, a almost an obligation uh, to either join as a member at a higher level or, or to donate. Uh, my parents lived in Denver for, for years and the only time my father ever went to the Denver Zoo was when I would come to visit. Uh, other than that, uh, they always maintained a membership uh, to the institution because he felt that it was part of supporting an important part of the Denver community. And I think that's something that we hope people in our communities will embrace, is that these institutions are, are really part of the heart of our communities and they really deserve people's support. So whether they're making an outright donation to support something that they care about as some aspect of conservation, or in general, they think that education is important to support the schools and families and, and, and kids, uh, that, that they will not only become a member to uh, gain access to the institution, uh, but they're going to up that to, to make sure that their contribution counts. And it's really going to be about the value proposition that you have to different audience segments, right? You have. Uh, people who are young and old and different genders and different sensibilities and different backgrounds, different living circumstance. In terms of, in terms of how you see it uh, evolving, Tanya, over the next uh, several years, and we'll give you the last word, um, how do you see this, this institution evolving in San Francisco? 
I think actually it's going to become more vital. There's no such thing as wild places, safe places for animals uh, in the globe. And it's going to have to be here at the zoo. So our community just has to see the zoo more as a sanctuary uh, and, and something to, to say. We've been around 90 years uh, and I, I'm confident that we'll be around for another 90 years. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you both for uh, sharing the work that you've done. Um, thank you for uh, helping these institutions to remain vital. That's the nonprofit report. Attendees, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your questions, and I hope that uh, you received some answers. I know we weren't able to cover everything. Everyone stay safe, and, uh, and have a great, great day.